It's good to see you here. Welcome back. Good evening. My name is Alan Price. I'm the director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching this evening's program online and in person here tonight. Uh, to open, I begin with a land acknowledgement to recognize the indigenous tribes of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples of the Wampanoag Tribal Confederation territories, who both past and present and throughout many generations have stewarded the land where the Kennedy Library stands today. While a land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important way to promote indigenous visibility, and it serves as a reminder that we are on stolen and settled indigenous lands. I invite us all to contemplate how to better support indigenous communities and to learn how to honor and take care of the land that each of us inhabits. Thank you. I would very much like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and AT&T, and our media sponsor, the Boston Globe. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this morning, this evening, sorry. Uh, you'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. When the Q&A starts, we will invite those of you who are joining us in person today to proceed to the microphones in the aisles and ask your questions. We're grateful to have this timely opportunity to consider some of the key issues that we're, that we're facing in the fall election cycle with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. I'm pleased to extend a warm welcome back to the Kennedy Library to Jonathan Capehart. A Pulitzer, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, he is an associate editor at the Washington Post, where he has been a member of the editorial board since 2007, hosts the Cape Heart podcast, and anchors the weekly Washington Post live show, First Look. He is also an MSNBC contributor and an anchor of The Sunday Show with Jonathan Capehart. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love that. At PBS, Capehart <laughs> serves as a commentator on the PBS NewsHour and is featured on the popular Friday segment, Brooks and Capehart. Oh, well, thank back. you. Thank you. Especially you. <laughs> I'm also delighted to welcome Ali Vitali to the library this evening. A Capitol Hill correspondent for NBC News, she covered the 2016 and 2020 presidential contests from primary to inauguration on the ground and with the candidates, as well as the 2018 and 2022 midterms now from across the country and in the nation's capital. She is the author of the new book, Electable, Why America Hasn't Put a Woman in the White House Yet. <laughs> And I'm so glad to welcome our moderator for this evening to the library, Lisa Desjardins, is a correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, where she covers, <laughs> where she covers news from the US Capitol while also traveling across the country to report on how decisions in Washington affect people where they live and work. Prior to joining NewsHour, she spent nearly 10 years with CNN as a senior correspondent and Capitol Hill reporter. Her reporting during and after the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol received numerous awards, including a Peabody. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Try it again. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Excellent. We are all thrilled to be here um, in this time that every time is historic by definition. However, this one is particularly crackling with, I think, the seams of history. Eras are ending, as we saw today in England. We aren't sure what era we are in in this country. 
And we know that this midterm election is going to be very important to defining who we are and defining the direction of this country. And something I think that goes missed about this time as well, as I'm moving away from Jonathan Kaplan, <laughs> our mics are butting each other. Um, I think we are in maybe a golden age of journalism as well. And it is my honor to be on stage with these two excellent journalists to just have this discussion tonight. And I'm very glad you all could join us. I want to start with both of you, big picture question. What do you think the mood is of this country right now as we head into the election? We're just, I think, a week from the first votes starting, the early votes starting, a month and a half out from this election. What's the mood of the country? Jonathan. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it, thank you all very much for being here and for the invitation to come back to the library. Uh, I'm going to defer to Allie because she's been out in the yeah. field, but yeah. from, where I, from where I sit, the mood in the country, I think, is um, frightening. It's frightening for those who feel that um, their liberties are being taken away. Uh, if you are LGBTQ or the parent of a trans non-binary child, you're frightened that the government is coming for your children uh, and coming for you because you have those children. Um, if you are a woman or person who can, who can become pregnant, the government is now saying we're putting limits on your own bodily autonomy. You have a Supreme Court justice in a concurring opinion who says, you know, now that we've overturned Roe v. Wade, let's go after Lawrence Obergefell and Griswold, contraception, same-sex marriage, um, and the right to privacy uh, between two consenting adults. Um, and then on top of all of that, you've got the specter of January 6th, whereas we saw the insurrection at the Capitol, uh, an insurrection that you nobly and valiantly reported from while all hell was breaking loose, that that hasn't ended. The, the, the anger that was unleashed within the Capitol is still out there. And if anything, it's metastasized. And so I think the mood right now, we will find out on no November 8th, which sector of frightened will win out. And it is my fervent hope that the people who feel like their, their right to liberty, their right to freedom is worth fighting for by going into the ballot box um, is that, what I think. Those are words that both parties use, that, liberty and freedom. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Strikingly so lately. Mm -hmm. But I do think, as we have seen, um, particularly with the vote in Kansas, the ballot initiative in Kansas, that shocked everybody. I think, I hope that that side that fought for liberty is the side that wins out. I guess for me, and I'm so thankful to be here and that all of you are back in person and that we can all be back in person because this is the first one since the pandemic. So amazing for the library. Um, I, I would say the mood of the country is apprehensive. Um, and I think that the way that Jonathan sets it up is so important because I don't think that you can talk about the 2022 midterms without talking about January 6th. To me, that's such an inflection point for this country because the foundational set of facts and principles upon which we do democracy in this country was compromised on that day. It was somehow put up for debate. And this is still something that is being talked about and pushed in real time throughout many of the races that we're gonna talk about tonight in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, in Florida, in Georgia, all of these different states um, that were so pivotal in 2020 now becoming these little microcosms of what happens next in democracy going forward. Um, and I do think that it's fascinating that we hear words like liberty and freedom now being used with such dual function on both sides because when you look at places, and again, we're in such uncharted territory in this midterm election cycle for all of the reasons that Jonathan laid out, but also because with the Dobbs ruling at the Supreme Court, it fully put us into the state of post row. This was no longer theoretical. It's now truly the reality that America is in right now. And there is a percentage of the country that is happy about that. But then there are also six in 10 Americans who say that abortion should be legal in some or most cases. And that 60% of people, I think, 
is partly why we've seen the landscape shift so much here. And so I think there are a lot of questions that are gonna be asked now and answered at the ballot box in November, just because we've never seen what it looks like when voters have to vote on post row as its reality. You know, we've had, uh Polling has not always been accurate, let's say, in the, in the last few cycles, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes that's all we have to go on. Sometimes it's not. We had a vote in Kansas on abortion. That was something that was very clear to go on. So let's talk about the issues that you think will frame this election. I think six months ago, a lot of us were economy. It's the economy, stupid. Yeah. You know, but when I look at polling, it's very clear. And we had a Marist uh, PBS NPR poll uh, where it was clear that it, it is really shifting, especially among women. They are not as concerned about inflation anymore. Of course, inflation is going down a little bit, but their voter, women voters are moving more quickly than inflation is moving because of abortion. So I wanna ask you all about that. This, Democrats obviously <clears throat> see that as a reason to hope that their base and that women will swing over to them. Republicans, they're talking about crime now. They're talking about the border. Those are real issues and real communities. I want to ask both of you how you see those two issues, those two kinds of issues, the two frames that the parties are using playing out. I feel like perhaps for women and people who know women, it's not surprising that this would be an issue that completely reshapes the landscape of, elections, of an election cycle that was supposed to be so favorable to Republicans, because history would tell us that that's the way that this goes, but also because of the way that we see President Biden's approval ratings, because of the inflation numbers, because of the overall state of the economy, it made a lot of sense. I think then for, for this landscape to be reshaped by Roe is again, uh, unsurprising. And I think you're right that Republicans, when you and I are in the halls of Congress, would like to talk about anything other than that. The fact that Senator Lindsey Graham put forward <laughs> a 15 week abortion ban and most of the Republicans that we talked to in the halls of Congress were like, what? <laughs> um, many of them did not want to answer questions on camera. I tried very hard. <laughs> um, they, think, they think that it's an issue best left to the states. That's a stance, but certainly Graham has put this as a hot potato issue back in the center of Congress as well. That's not to say that the economy is not still a top issue, and certainly it's the one that Republicans are going to try to continue to turn the focus back to, but I definitely think that women voters and voters broadly who care about access to reproductive health can walk and chew gum at the same time, and I would go so far as to argue that abortion itself is an economics issue because mm -hmm. it is a healthcare issue, and it's how do you afford care, and I think a lot of voters are thinking of it that way too. You know, I would, I would add that what Senator Graham did last week was politically mystifying. Yeah. Everybody knew the inflation numbers were coming out at 8.30. What, what was that, Tuesday or Wednesday? I don't know. Days blend. The, the day of the big... <laughs> Tuesday. Tuesday. I think it was. Everyone knew that those numbers yeah. were coming out at 8.30 a.m. Tuesday morning. Everybody knew that those numbers were going to be high. Yeah. Everyone, by everyone in this case, I mean Republicans <laughs> were just yeah. waiting, yeah. waiting for that, to, for that number to come out. And then along comes Senator Graham <laughs> to say, I am, in, I am introducing a bill to institute a national 15-week ban on abortion. That's why folks were running away from you. Exactly. <laughs> they didn't want to talk to you. Yes. And that to me is, told me a lot that under normal circumstances, the economy would be the Achilles heel of the White House and Democrats writ large. But the fact that a senior, senior Republican senator drops this abortion ban in the middle of it and Republicans run away from the idea, they run away from him, they run away from you and don't wanna talk about it, tells me that we should believe our eyes and we should believe our ears, that the Dobbs decision, the overturning of Roe, the earthquake out of Kansas, the earthquake out of New York 19, that, that um, congressional race is real and the aftershocks are still being felt. And the ultimate will be, will be in November, but as we all know, it's a long time in politics. But I think I was reading in Politico this morning that you know Republicans were preparing for a wave election. We were all preparing mm -hmm. for a wave election. It McCarthy was talking to yeah. us about mm -hmm. if it's plus 16 in 2020, yeah. it's on the map for us now. Mm -hmm. And so, but what Politico is saying today, we're quoting um, pollsters saying, 
well, maybe it will be not a wave election, but waves, mm -hmm. cross currents, mm -hmm. that depending on the yeah. race, depending on the part of the country, mm -hmm. abortion could be the issue. Mm -hmm. Or in another part of the country, it could be it could be inflation. But I think what we're seeing, what we've seen already, the issue of abortion is something that is front and center. It is galvanizing women to come out and vote, uh, come out and register to vote in numbers not seen in a long time. Um, but also, I, I think, um, I'm sorry. I, I just lost with, my train of thought. With younger people, too. It's, it's, a whole, right. it's really activating different groups. Right. It's activating different groups because it's not just abortion. It is an economic, it is yeah. an economics mm -hmm. issue, and it's a freedom issue. I just think the most like, apt way that I describe this particular issue is what so many sources have said to me, which is that they feel Republicans are the dog who caught the car on this. They never thought they would get there, and then finally they ended up with a court that was so conservative that they would move on this issue. And that has two impacts, right? The first is that Republicans can go back to their base and say, we did it. And there were so many voters who I've met over the years, who we've all met, who said that they were voting for Donald Trump because of the judges. And he put out that list of people he would appoint to the court, and that was galvanizing for a lot of conservative voters. And then there's the other side of it where all of the issues that Jonathan was talking about on contraception, on same-sex marriage, all of that then becomes much more realistic because Democrats then are going out on the campaign trail and saying, everyone told us we would never get to actually a post-Roe reality. We're there now. And also, all of these other things could happen. And it's why you're seeing Congress then move on things like same-sex marriage codification, attempting but failing to move. <laughs> I was about to say. I was, yeah. yeah. Well, there, there's some more hope for that than there is for you know, protections for abortion access. Well, but yeah. nevertheless. So the other side of that coin, of course, we're seeing Republicans uh, try to get into the national limelight on these other issues that they think could sway voters, crime, immigration. Yeah. We've especially seen, of course, something I know that you've called a stunt, other, many other people have called a stunt, uh, Republican governors sending buses or planes of, of migrants to generally blue areas, Martha's Vineyard, I don't know if anyone here from, is from Martha's Vineyard, it's possible in this audience. Um, I mean, there is a point where we do have a national problem and it is a problem that's facing border communities more than other communities. However, the politics of this, how, it's interesting to me that that message, many, for many years I've seen um, immigration, border crisis, can just immediately rise to the top of the headlines, but it hasn't right now, I don't think, um, in a way that I think the Republic, not yet, that Republicans have calculated. Do you have any thoughts on why that is? I'm just going through, maybe, because I don't have the answer myself. I mean, maybe it's because of abortion. Right. I mean, not so to keep coming about. back to it, yeah. but yeah. maybe that yeah. is it also. Maybe Republicans have gone to the caravan well yes. one too many times. Like every time an election comes along, suddenly Republicans and Fox News start talking about the caravans of migrants coming towards the, the southern border. So I think there's that. But then the other thing is using human beings as props, um, as, part of, uh, as part of a stunt, um, I think is starting to wear, wear thin. It's one thing to send busloads after busloads of migrants to New York, uh, black Democratic governor, Washington, D.C., black Democratic, um, I'm sorry, black Democratic mayor, Washington, D.C., black Democratic mayor, Chicago, black Democratic mayor, mm -hmm. then planes to Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. which, you know, there are people who live there year round, but then during the summer, Lots of African Americans show up at um, um, Amartya's Vineyard, Robinson. taking yeah, and right, taking over. right, taking yeah. people, lying to them, putting them on planes, and then dropping them on an island they didn't expect to go to. I think is using human beings in a way that I would hope would shock the conscience of a lot of Americans, and then turn the question back on the Republicans. My question, and I said this to Judy on Friday, where are Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis? Why haven't you seen them in the halls of Congress? If this is such an emergency, shouldn't they be working towards a solution? Shouldn't they be in Washington at least once a week 
pressuring Congress to do something, showing up at the White House. I bet President Biden would gladly take a meeting with Governors Abbott and DeSantis if they were serious about coming up with a solution about immigration, but, but they aren't. And that's why I think these stunts are being viewed as what they are. They are stunts that are putting people's lives at risk. One more big picture question, sort of, and then, and then I'm going to talk about the Senate and the House, which I know a lot of people that that's the, uh, the whole ball game in Washington this year. Um, oftentimes we talk about border groups in terms of where they live, and the suburbs have often gotten a lot of attention. And I've noticed recently in our polls, we've seen a huge split between suburban men and women. So this comes to the same gender split that we're talking about. Um, that's a group I'm looking at. It might be the same group you're looking at, but I'm wondering what groups of voters or what places you are looking at. Because if you're talking about an election which has different waves in different places, where are you watching to see what kinds of voters do you think are going to be the most important? Well, I, I mean, in a normal election year, yeah. I, I probably would have an answer, <laughs> but I think th this, this, this midterm, yeah. I would be crazy to say, well, I've got my eye on this <laughs> definitive group I because they are, going to, they are going to determine this election. We don't know. I think Ali said it right. We are in uncharted territory. We do not know wh how this is going to turn out, um, who's going to turn out. Yeah. Um, but I do think we kind of have a, a, a finger on why people are going to turn mm -hmm. out. What do you think, Ellie? I will shock you by saying I'm looking at women. <laughs> 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 but truly I am, in large part because I want to see, not just state by state, but if suburban women are actually as moved on this issue as we think that they might be. Um, I know that part of the Biden coalition, which people talk about in 2020, is somewhat irreplicable in large part because you had such, and we use this word all the time, but an unprecedented pandemic. You had Donald Trump in the White House, Democratic voters so galvanized that they would vote blue no matter what, but they ended up with Biden for a lot of reasons that make sense in retrospect. And that coalition, the way it either holds together or falls apart, I'm gonna be looking very closely at in places like Michigan, for example. Gretchen Whitmer, I think, is a great bellwether race on a statewide level, but in a more micro way, looking at races in Virginia, for example. There's a trio of women whose races I think are really fascinating, Elaine Luria, Jennifer Wexton, and Abigail Spanberger. And I think the Spanberger race specifically is a really great bellwether for national Democrats and how they're faring. Um, so that's one of the groups I'm looking at. And then the other is, Democrats have been talking for the last few years now about the problems that they're having with Hispanic voters and the ways in which they're talking or rather not being able to talk effectively to that group of voters. And this is going to be a great cycle to see how it plays out in Florida um, because you've got a governor and a Senate race there. Those are going to be fascinating, but more widely across the board as well. Um, you know, does Arizona stay a bluish state? Does Georgia stay a bluish state? Those gains that were made in 20, um, how temporary were they? I'm hoping, I, have, I want to talk more about Hispanic voters. I'm hoping that we, I think we could get to that next when we talk about the House, because there's some interesting things, I think, happening there um, in those elections. But let's start with the Senate. Let's start with the 50-50 Senate. I can't believe I get to cover a 50-50 Senate. It's the best of times How and the worst of times. How lucky am I as a reporter? Thing. It's bananas. <laughs> I think for everyone here, it is just as wild as you think it is in the Capitol. It is um, a very strange place. Everyone knows that every vote counts even more than usual for a senator. Um, my question to you all is, it seems clear, Democrats, my reporting is, everybody's hearing this from all of our, our Democratic sources, they're feeling very confident about the Senate right now, uh, even though it's 50-50. Um, but when I look at the polls again, can we trust the polls? A lot of those races are still close. Georgia's still within the, you know, the margins. Nevada's still within the margins. Yep. Those are some serious money pouring into those states now. <laughs> Ohio may be possibly in reach, but Ohio, North Carolina, those are states that Democrats always get close to and they kind of just slip through. Maybe yeah. this is the year. My question to you, do you think Democrats should be as confident as they are? Or are we where Jonathan says, we don't know, you know? Tune in. Yeah. I'm gonna do my best cape part. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right, though. I yeah. mean, first of all, I have trust issues with polling too. Right. Um, but <laughs> something fun about me. 
Um, so, so there's that, but I think a trend is really important. I don't go poll to poll. I, I, I do right. think trend lines are really important. Um, and I think the story for the Senate races mostly is just a story of candidate recruitment. Right. Knowing Rick Scott and knowing the relationships that he mm -hmm. had when he was a governor. He's cover the Florida governor who. Exactly, the Florida is, governor, now he, senator. Former Florida governor, now senator. Exactly, yeah. who's the head of the Senate campaign arm for, arm for Republicans. I truly thought that his relationships with people like Doug Ducey um, would have helped him better recruit with Sununu mm -hmm. in neighboring New Hampshire. I thought that those relationships would help him recruit what could have been a very strong slate of Senate candidates for Republicans. And when that fell through, I do think that the criticisms in Washington, which created the weirdest dust up between Mitch McConnell and Rick Scott a few yeah. weeks ago over you know, who's actually on the side of Republicans winning in 2022, um, I do think that's going to be the story of this cycle for Republicans. So I don't know if Democrats should be optimistic, but I know that Republicans have reason to to have question marks about the places that they should have been able to make gains. Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire yeah. was a race that they had been feeling good about prior to candidate recruitment falling yeah. apart there. Same with Mark Kelly in Arizona. And then on the flip side of it, you look at places like Ohio. You know, Tim Ryan is someone, Youngstown, he's, he's been in Trump country for a while. You know, it's not unheard of for Democrats to win in Ohio. Sherrod Brown has deep roots there. He's proven it can be done. Um, I know that it's overplayed to say it comes down to turnout, but like it matters it who, who comes out in those key states. I mean, I can back you up that the Senate Republicans in the last week especially have been very cranky, very angry. Yes. They've been, and it actually it actually has effect legislating for sure. I think so too. Um, and I think, you know, these are people who five, six months ago were imagining their committee chairmanships. They were thinking of who was going to be their committee chief of staff. All of those things are on the line for them. And, and now they see that slipping away. So you can, you can feel that. Um, whether it ends up that way or not, I don't know. A race you mentioned that I'm sure this group is interested in, as well, and I am as well, is New Hampshire. Jonathan, Democrats did something very interesting. Oh, did you hear that? No, no, ask okay, about New, okay, Hampshire, okay, then New gonna, Hampshire, then okay. I'm going to pivot. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to. No, gonna, no okay, ask, okay, okay. ask about New Hampshire. Um, New Hampshire, we saw Democrats <laughs> purposely use money to, to help the more conservative, more Trump, at one time election denier candidate, Don Balduck, uh, Maggie <laughs> Hassan's dream opponent for Senate, um, who, who indeed now is farther down in the polls. That race is now seen as likely for the, or leaning for the Democrats to pick up. Um, do you think, was this sort of just a lucky trick play that they were able to do in a state where they could get, Democratic voters could switch easily to vote in any primary they wanted? Or is this something, because we see the Republican Party again and again in its primaries choosing uh, more far right, more extremist candidates, is this something we're, we're gonna see Democrats doing more? Um, so I'm not gonna pivot as quickly as I thought. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, I think Democrats are playing with fire by voting in Republican primaries for the most extreme candidate, simply because there are no guarantees yeah. that the Democrat general election candidate is going to win. And so my fear is that, and while in New Hampshire, of all the states, maybe, you know, New Hampshire, I'm not so worried about that happening, um, especially since, you know, we, we showed on my show yesterday, Bull Duck, um, they showed this clip of him being definitive, you know, uh, the election was stolen and Donald Trump should be the president and Joe Biden's not legitimate. And, yeah. <laughs> and then he wins and he's like, hamana, hamana, hamana. Uh, yeah, yeah, Joe Biden's the president, I think, yes. Uh, so that flip-flop there, I don't think helps him. And, you know, great, good, good for Senator Hassan. I am optimistic overall about Democrats' chances of holding the House and maybe even getting President Biden the two Senate seats he asked for. Holding the House or holding the I'm Senate? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, holding the Senate. Holding the Senate, okay. And holding, holding the Senate. But, you know, I mean, Tim Ryan in Ohio, everyone was saying, nice guy, he's not going to win. But that was six months ago. Mm -hmm. He's got a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. um, Wisconsin, um, the Lieutenant Governor, Mandela Barnes, mm -hmm. polls are tightening. But he's got a really great campaigner. He's right. got a really Hitting good shot. Mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania, the lieutenant governor Fetterman and some guy who moved from New Jersey <laughs> to Pennsylvania, <laughs> Mehmet Oz. Um, 
you know, those polls, I think Fetterman is, Fetterman is up. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah Fetterman's I mean, up. Tightening. It's like it's a, yeah, plus six, plus seven now, average. The race that worries me is Georgia, mm -hmm. the Georgia Senate race. Mm -hmm. and, and it worries me because while Senator, Reverend Senator Warnock mm -hmm. should, you know, should be fine as an incumbent, um, as, you know, a prominent person in Georgia, I just worry about, Herschel Walker, who makes no sense whenever he gets to a microphone. And I know I'm making these two nervous because I'm the opinion guy here <laughs> and I get to spout off and they have to try to hold their faces straight, no, no reacting. So I just want to make that clear. I, apo I apologize, but I'll continue. Um, Herschel Walker, who makes no sense when he speaks and yet he has a fighting chance because I, I think there are there are voters in Georgia who don't like or don't appreciate being branded MAGA Republican, which is, you know, for a lot of people, you know, synonymous with intolerant, xenophobic, racist, the whole thing. And so, and they don't want, they're not going to vote for Re Senator Reverend Warnock. So here's a black Republican we can vote for and we'll be, and we can feel good about ourselves. And that is the, that is why I'm so worried about that particular race, that there could be a Senator Herschel Walker. And that might be one reason for me to get a Senate uh, press pass, because I would love to be on site for those floor speeches. But I hope they never happen. First of all, come hang out with us. <laughs> yes, come. I, we can get you a day pass anytime, also. Oh, that's good yeah. to I would know. say the other thing yeah. that I think about here, too, as Democrats have been trying to play in these primaries, I covered Trump in 2016, and I remember the phone calls that I would have with the Clinton campaign at the end of the primary when it looked like Trump was going to sew it up, but it hadn't quite happened yet. And they were licking their lips at the chance. They thought this was the greatest thing that had ever been handed to them. And we never had President Hillary Clinton, so we know how bad a prediction that was. And I think that as I watch Democrats try to play in primaries like Peter Myers in Michigan, um, in, in New Hampshire, there is an open question about if they haven't learned the lessons of feeling too confident in 2016. Because in the same way that there were record numbers of votes cast in 2020 for Joe Biden, Donald Trump also had a record number of votes cast for him. And he is a president who has sustained support in his party. And I think that's something that I keep close to mind each time I hear this narrative in play. We have to remember, Donald Trump, in his re-election, got 12 million more or, votes than he, than did, he did in 2016. Right. 12 million more votes. Give it and he every, lost. And he lost. And he improved, lost. And improved, improved, improved his say, support with white women, improved his support with yeah. black voters. Black men, let's black be men. specific. No, of course. You are, you're very <laughs> black, right. Black men. <laughs> yeah. But still. Yeah. Sorry. Let's talk about the House. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She likes to go in confident. She says she never holds a vote unless she has the votes. She can't stop this election, so it's going to happen whether she has the votes or not. Um, she says that she's going to hold on the House and pick up seats. My reporting is, you might have this reporting too, is that Senator Schumer privately told a few, you know, let's say sort of kitchen cabinet type Democratic senators yeah. that she is not likely going to hold the House. Who is right? Um, there are, I, I have 60 competitive seats, just takes four or five to change it. What do we think? You and I were both in that press conference a mm -hmm. week ago with, with Pelosi mm -hmm. on the day that she wouldn't mm -hmm. answer questions mm -hmm. about her future as potential speaker if her predictions of holding the House are right, but instead pivoted to a much more confident message than we had heard from her, yeah. I think, ever at any point this year. Um, and it, it makes sense as to why, right? She has to be the lead cheerleader for the party, but also you have to be feeling better than when you thought that you were gonna get completely wiped off the map. And now you're seeing the way that these special elections have gone in places like Kansas, in places like New York, but also I was just in Alaska. Hmm. In part, you look at Mary Peltola taking that special election, the Democrat, in part, it's because of ranked choice voting. The system that they used there was beneficial to candidates who built consensus. Also, Republicans really did not play a very good strategic game there because they were too busy saying the system was rigged than to actually strategize within it. But 
that does show Democrats in Washington that there is widespread from Ruby Red, Alaska, a state that really enjoys freedoms. And I think the last time that they elected a Democrat there was actually 50 years ago, right before Roe. And I think that they are seeing a wave of change, whether it's change that gives them all of their seats plus a few extras because the margins there are super tight too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have a long time to go until November. A lot can happen. But it makes sense why at the cusp of September, Pelosi's feeling better than she was at the start of the summer. Um, I interviewed Speaker Pelosi um, just after, no, just before Labor Day uh, 2016. And I asked her a question about you know, the potential of a President Trump. And she said definitively, those two words will never go together, President and Trump. I was like, oh, okay. And so we know how that, that, that uh, worked <laughs> out. But to Ali's point, the speaker, of course, is going to be a cheerleader for her party. I also think she is, and Democrats are, are understandably more confident, but they still have, they have a couple of issues um, that are getting in the way. One is history. The party of the president just elected usually loses seats in the House uh, of, in the president's first term. It's only, it's only been defied twice, most recently 20 years ago under George W. Bush, when he gained seats. The other is gerrymandering. Hmm. Those House districts are gerrymandered yeah. to within an inch of their lives. And I remember um, I was going to have Rachel Bittekoffer on my show earlier this year, and I wanted her to do a whole thing, an elect election forecaster, um, if you don't know her. And I wanted her to pick out you know, the key seats to watch. And she wrote back, she said, I can't pinpoint <laughs> a, 10 seats because after redistricting, yeah. Democrats will lose 10 seats. And they have to hold on to five in order to maintain the majority. So that's, those are the headwinds that are, facing, that are facing Democrats. The environment is much better. And, you know, they're not look, Republicans aren't looking at a plus 16 or whatever. They're yeah. maybe looking at single digits, which might also explain why P Speaker Pelosi is so confident about Democrats, because she remembers what it was like as minority leader with Speaker Boehner. And the things yeah. Speaker Boehner could not get done without Democratic help, budgets, uh, debt ceiling, all sorts of other things. So if Democrats are in the minority, it's a matter of by how many seats. Is it single digits? And will, will Speaker, whoever it is, I, I'm not convinced it'll be Speaker McCarthy. I can tell you my theory later on. Um, no, we're, no, we're here. No. But, but whoever the, whoever the speaker, whoever the, the speaker, show, folks. <laughs> whoever the speaker is, is going to have to turn to whomever the um, um, Democratic leader is and say, help me. I well, do I also, think, go sorry. ahead, Allie. I also just think the way that that Republican majority will look, if it is a Republican majority, is going to be striking because I think Boehner is going to look like child's play compared <laughs> yeah. to That's whatever part I that out. speaker, yeah. maybe it's McCarthy, maybe it's Scalise, maybe it's somebody else, is going to have to deal with just because of the sway that we've already seen the far right portions of that caucus have. The fact that Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Lauren Boebert, they are fundraising machines. They are tapped into the grassroots, and that's why they command the power that they command within that conference. And so for McCarthy, someone who's made the calculation to go with Harriet Hageman over Liz Cheney, time and again making those calculations to side with whoever was more Trumpified, that's something that's going to come back to him when he's actually trying to legislate, because it's a group of lawmakers who are not beholden to the same structures. Yep. They are beholden to a grassroots that is not always in tune with the way that Washington actually works, the way those gears actually grind. I think that he's going to have, or she, I guess, I don't know, I can't think of a woman who could be speaker of that conference, but, but <clears throat> that he is going to have a I real... I think there's some that could be. I don't think there's some that Stephonic would have eventually have the opportunity. Right, but yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so here's my thing. So, yeah. so here's my theory. <laughs> Lean in. So remember, remember when those tapes came out, the J. Mart um, mm -hmm. Burns yeah. book came out, yes. and you've got um, Leader McCarthy saying, talking all sorts of smack about Donald Trump and the 
you know, election and insurrection and the whole thing doesn't, doesn't come off so well, right? The first thing I did was count down how long it would take Donald Trump to respond. And it took yeah. a long time. And then when he responded, it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was fine. I mean, if you watch mafia movies, you know to read like between the lines. And it wasn't exuberant, but it wasn't, you know, kicking him in, you know, mm -hmm. in, in front of a train. We have seen this movie before with mm -hmm. Donald Trump. He is the ultimate revenge is a dish best served <laughs> yeah. cold and when it is most humiliating for the person who's eating it. So, re this is my theory. <laughs> Republicans win the majority, they win the House majority. Kevin McCarthy goes for the speakership. Mark my words, you heard it here first. Pay attention to what Donald Trump does to him mm -hmm. in that speaker's race. How, does he make it easy for him? Or does he say really nice things about Elise Stefanik? Mm -hmm. I could see that being... Or Jim Jordan. Or Jim Jordan. Or Jim Jordan. Or Steve or Scalise, who you know he is a big fan of. I yeah. don't know, I just remember when that whole thing yeah. shook out with the McCarthy tapes, what Trump world sources were saying to me is that Trump was just sort of giddy at how much power it showed he had over mm -hmm. someone, that he could make someone who is very powerful in Washington and Kevin McCarthy change his tune in such a significant way. And really grovel, almost and really, probably grovel. Yeah, like and, and, and take and, and, the heat apology. for yes. being on one side of the January 6th issue and then so clearly coming to the other side of it with that handshake at Mar-a-Lago and then all of the interviews and questions he's faced after. I mean, that to me as someone who's covered Trump for so long, like it made it a lot of sense mm -hmm. that that would be Trump's reaction, not like, oh, this guy is talking smack about me on a call, but instead, oh, how powerful do I look mm -hmm. a year and a half out? And to me, that's so indicative of the way that that universe views politics and how Trump leverages power in Washington. I, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, keep cutting no, you off, please. Yeah. On Jim Jordan, chair of judiciary. Yeah. So he can investigate the, the, Biden, the Biden administration ref, left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. those That's are my predictions. He Sorry, could Lisa. have run for Senate. He could have run for yeah. Senate, but he wants this job. He, he's, he's always been, he's a wrestler. He, that's what he likes to do. He likes to uh, kind of get in there. He's sort of, sort of a grenade thrower. I don't think he'd even mind saying that sometimes. Um, but I think that people don't realize it's not just with the House Republicans. Democrats have their own internal divides, but it's generally yes. along one, you know, progressives and moderates, generally. For Republicans, it's much more chaotic than that. There are many different side groups. I reported on a meeting of the House Republican Study Committee, which is the largest single caucus in the House Republican yeah. Conference, um, that happened last week. They were talking about the Lindsey Graham abortion bill, and it was just a nightmare meeting for them. Marjorie Dannenfelser, who is the um, head of uh, a major uh, anti-abortion group, she was in the Lindsey Graham news conference, was there. And what happened was there's the one group of people who said 15 weeks is n way too moderate, it has to be nothing, we want, we want a total national ban on abortion. Others say no, 15 weeks. Others, like libertarians, said no, we, what are we doing? This is not government's business at all. Let's stay out of it. And then still others were like, I'm going to lose my job. Let's stop talking about this issue. <laughs> and so yep. what you have is you're going to have a, a really potentially chaotic conference. And I think that's why when you talk about the House and you talk about the midterm margins like Jonathan's doing, it's so important because without kind of the Trumpness of it all, without the Marjorie Taylor Greene of it all, um, already, Kevin McCarthy has a solid five House Republicans who will not vote for him. Yeah. Do not like him, do not trust him, do not think he's the direction or face um, of a speaker. And so he needs past that. And then, in addition, you've got problems with Freedom Caucus or Super Freedom Caucus folks. So if, you, if you're talking eight, nine. Is that a term? It's Are we using that now? Super just, Freedom Caucus? Super Freedom Caucus. I like that. Let's use that. <laughs> Super Freedom Caucus. It's sort of how I think of it. Because um, there's the Fifth Freedom Caucus and there's Super Freedom Caucus. Uh, but, but I think that it's going to be a very wild ride. Whether they win the majority or not, I think the House could be close. Or I, I think it's just the House is going to be something else again. 
Um, <laughs> this all sort of brings us back, this is the theme that you've woven through this, January 6th. Yeah. Candidates who still openly doubt, sometimes deny the election results. You know, I think 538 uh, did a really effective breakdown of looking at over 500 candidates running either for statewide office, so governor, secretary of state, AG, um, or congressional offices this year, it's 500 offices. And two, over 200 of the Republican nominees for those offices um, are election deniers, you know, and then another 100 doubt the, the election took place. Now, some of these are not races that Republicans will win, but many of them are. I think they were predicting about 100 of these folks will win. Um, my question to you, voters are still making these decisions. I'm a reporter who still believes that voters think about the decisions that they make. You know, it's not someone drops a billion dollars in ads, so that is happening, and automatically, you know, mind controls our country. However, something's happening right now, and I'm, I'm wondering what you all think. Why is it that these election deniers have so much appeal? Is it just this country's, some people in this country feel like there's a leadership vacuum and they were drawn to Trump and they just are convincing themselves that, oh yeah, maybe the election was a fraud? What, what is happening here with voters when we have again and again undisputed proof that the election was not fraudulent? I know it's the question of our time, but it's and not, and I don't yeah, know if I had answer. the answer to that, I, yeah. I would, I'd be getting paid a lot more money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no. you, well, let me ask you a different one. Yeah. You, you no. all think that that is growing? It's, I heard to say from you, you seem to I think, think so. it's getting... Yeah, I mean, it, uh, and, and I don't mean, I'm not making light of your question. It's, right. the question you ask is, to, to my mind, the biggest question that we face as a country. Yeah. Because we've got election deniers because of a former president of the United States refused to accept the, the will of the people mm -hmm. and then decided to cast doubt on it after spending four years trashing government and trashing governing and trashing democracy and siding with autocrats instead of his own um, intelligence services. And so, and still holding such sway over, over that party. So now, if, you're, if you want to be a Republican and you want to be an elected Republican, You've got to be as close to him as you possibly can be. And right now, that means being an election denier. Hmm. I mean, one could potentially be the governor of Pennsylvania. Another could be the governor of Arizona. And the fact that they are in these positions, an election away from gaining actual power, is what's so disturbing because when you, when you really boil it down, the election of Donald Trump, he's not the disease, he's not the symptom, he's not the disease, he's a symptom. He unleashed really ugly forces in this country that had been just below the surface. By being elected president of the United States, he gave those ugly forces the imprimatur of the president of the United States. When he sided with white nationalists in Charlottesville, he ceded the moral authority of the presidency and doing a moral equivalence between the white supremacists and the protesters out there, including Heather Heyer, who was murdered. And still, and that's just one example, and still, four years later, he gets 12 million more votes in a country that is... It's like an exclamation point. I right. really want him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In a country that is becoming browner. In a country where the dwindling white majority is, and I'm speaking in broadly general terms, is scared about what's happening to the country from their perspective. But more importantly, the, their loss as the central political and cultural focus in this country. And what Donald Trump gives them is someone to latch on to. And if gaining power or holding on to power is being latched on to him, then that's where they're going to go. That's your answer to why. I get that's, it. That's, I that's, get it. that's I got partial. it. Allie. I, I don't think I have the why, but I think a few things have struck me as I look at the last like five to six years in totality, right? 
Uh, my first presidential election is 2015, 2016. I'm on the road with Donald Trump's campaign. And I used to hear uh, at every rally what people would say to me at that point was, well, he says what we say quietly around our kitchen table. And I'm struck by it. I don't really hear hmm. that anymore. Hmm. No one who's there at those rallies feels that these are things that are any more confined to their kitchen table because of the way that he has legitimized a lot of the grievances of his supporters from podiums that command the most power that a podium can command. Um, and I think then about January 6th, a moment that I had in 2016 in Colorado, but I had heard it in North Carolina and in Georgia to the point where I had pitched my editor on a story on it and we were doing it. And, and the lead anecdote of the piece ended up being a man in, in Colorado saying to me that by prayer or by pitchfork, Donald Trump would be president in 2016. And that if he didn't win the 2016 election, this man believed that something would have had to gone haywire and he would march on Washington. And I've thought about that a lot, especially after January 6th, but I thought about it a lot after the 2020 election was called, because I think a lot of us in the kind of dark humor that you use in newsrooms, because you know that you're probably gonna face this at some point, would talk about how before the inauguration we would have to brace for some kind of civil reckoning in this country if Trump were to lose, and then we mm -hmm. talked about it after he did. And those were things that I actively thought about. And the third thing that I thought about, which again isn't an answer as to why, but it's something that's like in my brain, is there are a lot of people who we have access to now who are former members of the intelligence community. People like Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs is one of them. I was just out in Utah with Evan McMullen, who's a former CIA analyst, now running for Senate in Utah. And what all of them have said is that they have seen what coups and shifts towards autocracy look like in other countries, but that they are shocked to be seeing these things happening here. And Sarah Jacobs is a Democrat. Evan McMullen, though, comes from the more conservative end of the spectrum. He's run now in 16 as an independent for president, now in Utah as an independent there, but still someone who came from the conservative side of this. So this is not just Democrats trying to make a point here. And I think that when we listen to these people as experts in foreign policy, in the way that uh, fascism shifts and manifests, I think those are things that I pay very close attention to because it's sort of similar to the way that we started this conversation where I don't think that we all operate from the same set of facts anymore. And that to me feels dangerous. I think then the other, the other big question of course is how in, given our politics at this moment, how does that change? You know, because I think that um, being at the Capitol, both you guys can probably speak to this in Washington, especially for Democrats, very raw feelings, very, yeah. very raw feelings after January 6th. Feelings, you know, I've seen angry politicians, I've seen politicians who wanted to take a swing at each other my whole career, but this was different. This was a sort of personal betrayal that I think especially Democrats felt, and a few Republicans, so they wouldn't say it publicly, um, <clears throat> toward other Republicans uh, who they feel caused January 6th. And I, what I saw, then that's its own kind of anger too, and, and I'm not saying it's unjustified. It may be, but, but, it, but the divide is very large. You know, there's not, it's not in these Democrats' interest to speak to Trump supporters, you know? It, and, they, and it may have been a couple years ago. Some of these, dem some of these Democrats might have, might have said, I wanna have that conversation. But after January 6th, I saw fewer and fewer of them wanting to have that conversation. And sometimes I think, oh, it's just, it's just time. We just have to get through this. The Constitution has to hold up, and we just have to keep going. But I mean, I guess we're having a conversation about the conversation. But it, mm -hmm. it, it, it still is how, how, what needs to happen. Our politics are rough. Well, I mean, I think the, the sense of betrayal is one that's real and justified. I mean, Democrats watched a president of the United States instigate an insurrection going against the Constitution. Hi. Who Hi. is it? It's is it a source? Madam Speaker. <laughs> Someone doesn't like this conversation. It's a very important Republican source. No, Ooh. no, it's not. No, it's not. Um, I'll, I'll finish no, the talk because I know okay, we have to good. go to, exactly. to we'll have to go to Q and A. Um, but I also want to focus you because I think I think my, what I'm trying to get at too is though like you know 
the voters. I understand politics. I understand why Republicans are doing what they're doing. You know, and you can get into, do they believe it, do they not believe it, who does believe it, what, all of that is, is a whole other ball of wax. But, but the voters is what I'm interested in, you know, and, and kind of having that conversation with voters. And how does that happen when they, nobody wants to listen to each other, which I know is the miracle yeah. question. They're, they're angry. Yeah. I mean, and I, I actually, I understand this. I come from a family, not my immediate family, but most of my family back home are Trump supporters. Some of them believe that the election was stolen. And, and I think it's because of who they heard it was stolen from. When you have an actual president sitting there saying that he won an election and that it was taken away from them, every American deeply values their right to vote and for that vote to count. And when someone tells you that it wasn't or that it was discarded, that hurt manifests there. And I think that he played with a real emotion and is continuing to stoke that. I'll sneak in one more. Do you think this could backfire now against the former president as we see someone like Ron DeSantis rise? Because I think there is now, for even some people who would say, I'm a fan of Donald Trump, I've talked to these voters yeah. in many different states who said, I voted for him. I, I don't, I don't think I can stomach him again. Republican voters it also, who it love also him. It may just be like, what? even if you love him or hate him, believe the election was stolen, wasn't, like it may also just be easier for Republican voters to be like, you know what, let's agree to disagree here, let's just move forward. And I've heard that. Yeah, there's a sentiment there. I mean, I've, I've said um, often, it doesn't matter. It's never mattered to me. I don't care if Donald Trump runs again in 2024 because it doesn't matter because it's not Trump, it's Trumpism. If, you, if, if Ron DeSantis is the next Republican nominee for president, how is he going to be any different than what Donald Trump would have been if he were on the ballot? How different would Rick Scott be? How different would Greg Abbott be? It's the same policies, but this time turbocharged with election denialism um, and also the experience of governing at the state level and bringing that kind of experience um, and that kind of that backward mantle. agenda mm -hmm. to Washington and the danger that that puts this country in. With that, we would love to take your questions. I have many more for them. So if you don't have any, I've got, I've got tons. Oh, I see good people coming up. Another time, Hispanic voters and Republicans, women voters and Republicans, all those good topics. So, yeah. But I want to see what... I see, Thank oh you. good, I see my friend out there, PBS Hi. NewsHour viewer. I yes, know. yes. Uh, <laughs> so everybody's talking about, it's not just Trump, it's Trumpism, and certainly is a national phenomenon that is polarizing the country. How do you break the cycle? What are ways to break the cycle? Obviously, whether it's on the internet or various uh, right-wing news networks, there's an echo chamber there, and once you do that, you get confirmation bias, and everybody buys in, and that's all they hear. How do you break the cycle? That's the problem, because otherwise it doesn't seem to be a solution to Trumpism and not just the man Trump. My, my answer to that is we would not be in the position that we, we're in now as a country if more Republicans stepped forward and said, Mr. President, what you're saying is wrong. What you're saying is not true. What you're saying is false. What you've done is lie to the American people. If Mitch McConnell, if Senate, then Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell had said during the impeachment, the trial, hey, uh, I'm voting to convict, and then give the same speech he gave after he voted not to convict, maybe things would be better. If former Speaker Paul Ryan or former Speaker John Boehner were to step forward in the way that out, now outgoing Congressman Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger were to speak out, or are speaking out, about what's happening to their party, then that trickles down to everyone else who's listening. We break the cycle by having leaders not just Democratic leaders saying, Democratic Party leaders saying, this is wrong, this is destroying the country, but having more Republican leaders join Liz Cheney, join Adam Kinzinger in saying that what is happening is wrong and that as Americans, we need to step up and send a message that it's wrong. Until that happens, 
the Republican Party and by extension the country is going to continue to slide along this very dangerous path. So without profiles and courage, uh, exactly. it won't happen. I do think the echo chamber point that you make is really important to think yeah. about is because at every turn, and this is happening on social media, this is happening in chat forums, it's certainly happening at different hours of Fox News uh, and other outlets, you can go and find your point of view continually confirmed for yourself with legitimate people on those platforms continuing to affirm it for you. I think that Capehart's 100% right, but look, the political realities for those people who have stepped forward has been yeah. almost yeah. completely 100% conclusive of all the people in the House who defied their party and voted to impeach the former president, almost all of them are gonna be out of office. And I actually think that seminal moment of the McConnell speech, is the party actually choosing to go with the path of least resistance that continues to allow it to win? And that's a choice. Like that is a choice for the party to make for who they wanna be going forward. And now it's a choice that's left to voters. If I could just add, I'm sorry. Um, the only crack I've seen in the echo chamber is by virtue of lawsuits against the networks themselves for liability reasons that have forced them to admit what really was reality and what was false news or fake news. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Go over here. Um, we're taping the news hour. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We would never miss Politics Monday. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell Amy uh, and Tam. Awesome. And before I ask my question, I just want to say one thing to Allie. Um, Alaska had a Democratic senator from 2009 to 2015, Mark Begich. In the House. I'm sorry. I should have been more specific. Yeah. No, no. They didn't, didn't have yeah. a, one, they didn't have one in the House for 50 years. Right. Until he died. Yeah. Um, I, want, I want to ask a question. I don't care who answers it. The question is this. In listening to you this evening, you talked about the fact that you felt that the Republicans were going to focus on crime and the economy as issues for voting in November. Picture yourself as a democratic strategist and answer the following question. In, with respect to crime, uh, it was the Republicans who said defund the FBI. With respect to crime, I don't think the people that were there on the Capitol in Janu on January 6th are going to vote for any of the Democrats. Okay. With respect to the economy, if you were a strategist, would you recommend to the Democrats in the House and Senate that on September 30th, when they have to fund the government for next year, would you put in a, an amendment to a bill that says every family that drives a car with a combustible engine, you get $500 back uh, because of these high gas prices that, uh, you know, we want to help you with your pain. Thank you. So I think the question is, should Democrats now be doing, I guess, more concrete if you were a strategist? I'll actions. answer that question since yeah. I'm the opinion guy. I try now. Yeah, I know. Going, <laughs> neither one of you is going to go for it. I, know. Um, uh, I thought that your, your idea about a $500 rebate for folks mm -hmm. driving uh, com combustible engine cars is an interesting, an interesting idea. Um, I think Governor Newsom in California probably comes closest to that. Mm -hmm. He's got a rebate. Uh, because they've got, he's got like a $20 billion budget surplus, something like that in California. So he's giving the money back to Californians. That's an interesting idea. When it comes to crime, Democrats have been saying, you know, you're trying to slam us with defund the police, but you guys won't, you see what the folks are doing with the FBI. I would also throw in a report from the um, centrist think tank Third Way we just done two reports now about, okay, Republicans, you want to talk about crime. Let's talk about where the crime spikes are really occurring per capita. And they are Kentucky, Mississippi, Alabama, um, basically red states, places that voted for, for Donald Trump in the last election. So I would add that to your political strategists. We'll take it. Like, <laughs> yes. In the Ohio State Senate election, now that uh, Mitch McConnell has funneled $28 million into J.D. Vance's campaign, do you think the Democrats have a legitimate chance? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that Ohio has become a very tough state for Democrats. And I think that um, they got a good draw in a candidate 
if you and Republican strategists have told me this that they think JD Vance is just not a good candidate. And by that I don't just mean his resume, that he just he's just not working it. He's not yeah. he's not someone who's really Didn't you take in the there. summer off? <laughs> JD <laughs> Vance he I mean, took the summer off. The fundraising circuit, right? I mean he's been <laughs> so so but but I will say in the last week um, he seems to be doing things, that campaign is doing things I hadn't seen them do before. He, he seems to be working harder. There is more money there, but you know, a lot of the TV ads have already been bought, so it's going to be hard for them to get up on TV, even with Mitch McConnell's money. So I, I think you can't count Democrats out, especially because I think, we didn't get to this, January 6th hearings are going to start again, uh, September 28th. I think that that's one of the, I just don't think that by itself moves needles, but I think it is part of a set of data points that Democrats are using, abortion is one of them, that puts doubts in um, some voters' minds about Trump and Trumpism that I think could help Tim Ryan in that state, could keep some people home that might not really like J.D. Vance, but would have voted for Donald Trump for Senate. So I, I think I think it's a long shot, but I, you can't rule it out. I don't know. You think I draw it. parallels too between the profile mm -hmm. of Democrat that Tim Ryan is and the profile of Democrat that Joe Biden is, mm -hmm. um, and I look at the way that Biden was not able to flip the current of Ohio going red. Yeah. So it's a good question. It's a good race. It's gonna be. It's a good race to. I might end up going to Ohio really soon. It's on my. It's on our, our list. Thank you. Sure. Okay, over here. One of the other um, things in the Republican playbook we haven't talked about tonight are all the efforts they made to make it harder to register and harder to vote. Do you think that that is going to be a major issue in, say, Georgia or any of the other close states? Or has the impact of the Supreme Court decision really galvanized voters that it won't, in the end, make as big a difference? That's a great question. Yeah. Georgia, I don't worry about because, I mean, even though they put in all those new voting restrictions and taken away drop boxes and, you know, limited all sorts of other access to voting, Stacey Abrams is the one who built the apparatus, yeah. the structure in Georgia to face down efforts to curb the vote four years ago. Or more, actually, the last time I was here was Stacey to interview Stacey Abrams. Um, hmm. uh, so Georgia, I think, is equipped to make sure that not only can people register to vote, but that they have all the tools needed to jump through all the hoops needed in order to vote in November. I think because of what we saw in, 20, in, in 2016 and 2020, that I think Democratic operatives and organizations are, are now much more hip to the fact that you can, you've got to make sure that not only you register people, but that you then stay on top of them to ensure that they, do, they follow all the new rules in place so that when they get to the ballot box in November that they can actually cast their ballot. I thought it was interesting too. I would have thought Again, like politics time is so weird, but I would have thought at the beginning of this year that this was going to be one of the seminal issues that Democrats were talking about on the campaign trail. And I think in Georgia, because of the role that Stacey Abrams has played, it is definitely an issue there. We watched that moment with her and Kemp on the debate stage just a few weeks ago where she talked about the attempts that have been made on the part of Republicans to restrict people's access to the ballot box there. I think that's it's a key issue in places like Georgia, but I'm actually surprised that it is not like mm -hmm. ranking as one of the top top and perhaps it's just because so much has changed over this summer but mm -hmm. I thought it would have been at the beginning of this. We have some related questions from YouTube um, that kind of add to this. One question, where I would like to see the panelists touch on disinformation um, and any anticipated effects of disinformation in the midterm election. We pay so much attention to that in presidential years. Um, but. Are you picking up on? I think we have a we have normal fact. You know, there's ads that are you know not factual. We, I've seen those. There are false ads out there. But in terms of disinformation, um, I wonder if you guys are picking up on anything particular midterm. I haven't. 
other than yeah. the typical typical right. like shenanigans. The, the typical shenanigans. I actually just think that like I, I'm very thankful that at MSNBC and NBC we have some amazing reporters who spend their time in these spaces, um, and I actually think that you know the ways in which it has not necessarily been curbed in the ways that it should be by the Twitters and the Facebooks and the metas, I guess now, like I think that's actually where the focus should probably turn next. It's not my beat, mm -hmm. Ooh, but, um, <laughs> but maybe it should be, um, yeah. We have a question for Jonathan. You were mentioning, again, from, uh, from online, that you were mentioning uh, using people as political pawns, dehumanizing people in the name mm -hmm. of politics, essentially. The question here is, do you think that this current crisis uh, with migrants could play a role in actually the other uh, side of that coin, galvanizing national attention on immigration rights and the plights of migrants? Could there be um, some work to be done, especially that could reach out to Hispanic voters, some sort of incentive for people to talk about migrant rights um, out of this? It's an interesting question. Um, it, it, I always caution um, myself when reading things and also our, our fellow reporters that when it, comes to, when it comes to Latino voters and Hispanic voters, immigration is not the only issue. It's right, yeah. And, and so... Which, I think is, which is, I think, one reason that, that it really, when Democrats were trying that, it wasn't, wasn't working. Yeah. And they're still very up for grabs. They're still voting right. on the race. Right. You know? I, yeah. I, I, that's why I said what I said about Governor Abbott and DeSantis. If you've gotten to the point where you are, I'm going to be critical, shipping migrants out of your state in order to send a message to, um, you know, democratic strongholds and blue states and blue sanctuary cities, never mind the fact that those cities and those states send more money to Washington that Florida and Texas take um, than those states um, get in return. But DeSantis and Abbott, if they were really serious about this, they would use their power as the governors of two important states. Yeah. They'd go to Washington and say, okay, look, President George W. Bush tried and couldn't get it done. President Barack Obama tried and couldn't get it done. We're Republicans, President Biden, you are a Democrat. You seem to want to get things done and you've gotten a lot done. Let's, we're going to camp out in the Roosevelt Room until we can come up with some, and bring in McConnell, bring in Schumer, bring in Pelosi, and we're going to come together on a Im comprehensive immigration bill that we can get done. That would be phenomenal. But because they won't do it, and because they would rather use people as pawns for um, either the party's gain or their own personal political gain for 2024, we're never going to get to that point. And that's, I, I appreciate the questioner, the, the person's question, but I don't, you can't galvanize if only one side is willing to galvanize. It's one thing to galvanize, it's another thing to galvanize with the intention of coming to a real solution. And that takes, in this country, that takes two parties. I should note, I for one would love to cover a Cori Bush style Ron DeSantis action in the White House where he just <laughs> stays put and just doesn't vote. I, I, I would cover that. So, here in our audience. Yes, hi. Hi. And actually, I have two questions. We one, do that all the time, so yeah, you can. Wonderful. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah. Okay. One is I feel like I'm a very average, intelligent person. I went to community college. Okay? Woo, I did go to Harvard, college. MIT. But I believe this country is so proud that we're getting from dumb to dumber. Is that your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> and if you think this is bad, just wait till the next layer. It's going to be the dumbest, and they're going to run this country. No. Oh, okay. Well, just wait until the next level. It's going to be the dumbest, and they're going to run this country. What and is I'm your question, out of I wonder? Here. What is your question? Okay, my question is, yeah. actually, I'm one for Jonathan. Okay. It has bothered me for a few years, but I didn't have anybody to ask. I, from what I read somewhere, I can't remember where, the last 2016 campaign, I read 
the Hillary, my favorite, I canvas for her four days a week, made phone calls, everything, that she went to rallies like in the 80s. The number I remember was like 88 rallies when she was running to be our president. But the number 45 had 150. Now that's a lot of difference. I wonder if Hillary had up her rallies up to 100, would, would that make a difference? Um, on, on that question, um, yeah, she should have done a lot more rallies. And in fact, she should have gone to Michigan. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> I remember two specifically, days. Specifically, she should have gone to Michigan. Yes. And one, one of Wisconsin, the, the Rust Belt. Yes, in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Part of the problem was that there were folks in her campaign who said, well, we don't need to go there because the analytics show we're fine. No. And that was, and that was the problem. So, so, yeah, should she have done more rallies? Absolutely. And of course, I know the Friday that FBI man early voting started came over that tape didn't help, yeah. but uh, yeah. uh, uh, that so, that Hillary didn't do enough of that. My fan would love to see her to be our first woman president. And you, don't throw you, eggs at me because no, I see we're going no, from no, no. dumb to you dumber. Said, <laughs> you know, the train sneaking. I want to try and get everybody. What's your other question? Do you have another question? That, oh, okay, that, that was it. That was, that was great. Okay, okay cool. <laughs> Over here. Um, thank you for doing what you do. I, we thoroughly enjoy. Um, your book is on my Christmas list. Hey! Um, I, I'm a, I uh, volunteer for Planned Parenthood. I'm an escort. And I have never seen, and I've been doing it a long ass time. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen the animosity and the um, uh, excitement on the uh, on on both sides. Really, and I am making a prediction. That I think women women of a certain age look at their granddaughters with less rights than. I think there's going to be a tsunami of women who is going to carry this home. Um, that's that's what I think. My question is: You think Biden's going to win again? <laughs> All right. Is by and this actually that was a, a good, hard turn. This actually, <laughs> and this does actually relate to the midterms because, as some of you might have seen at 60 Minutes last night, yeah. the president answered this question by indicating that he's not going to make a decision, or at least not announce a decision, until after the midterms, opening the door to see for the midterms to, I guess, affect it either way. Is he going to run again? And do the midterms really affect this decision? Mm -hmm. Can I tell you what I thought of first is the thing that a lot of my sources love to like whisper about with me, and I'm sure that it's the same for you guys, is it's sort of what they've all anticipated Biden would do, which is like he's known to, to wait a long time for decisions. I remember Veep stakes, we waited and then we waited an extra week because like deadlines are pretty fungible. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there are people who are concerned that this waiting game is going to go on for too long to the point where good contenders who might run are frozen out or start a little bit on a delay because Biden waits in the typical way that Biden tends to make decisions. Um, so that's a, that's a fear that I've heard aired. I, I mean, he did say in the interview yesterday that he can't really answer the right. question now because the moment yeah. he says he's running right. all sorts of right. laws yeah, and rules it. and things. Right. So, he said, I, I plan to run. He says, I, he says, I intend to well, run. Well, no, yeah. I plan to run. He said, I, I, in, I intend to run, and he, but he couldn't. He hasn't fully decided. Right. And yet. Speaker Pelosi has, has, has said many times, I intend to, you know, <laughs> I intend for Democrats to maintain the majority. <laughs> Pl plans, plans can change. Plans can change. Yes. Yeah. Do I think President Biden will run, run again? Yes, I think he will run again. Um, and yes, I think he would win again. Is he the best? Oh, do you think he's the best Democratic candidate? Well, for he's president? the sitting president of the United States. That doesn't, I mean, it doesn't always we, work out. If, if Democrats want to do to Joe Biden what Walter Mondale did to Jimmy Carter, go right ahead, <laughs> but you know how that story, how that story ended. Also, Chester Arthur, same thing happened, just I'll, to point that I'll out. Take your word for yes. it. Um, Number 21. <laughs> <laughs> same thing it, happened. Okay. It was a shame. It was a shame. Okay. Yeah. But I, w I won't prattle on about why, why I think so, but I, okay. I think he'll run again. Okay. And, Good question. Yeah. All right, over here. Uh, thank you for being here. And I 
I too uh, really appreciate all the things that you do in trying to bring us or get to us some semblance of truth out of this insane time. But I am also very happy to be alive and going through this right now. I never thought I'd see this country this divided. Uh, and as far as Trump goes, and then I'll get on to the main point, is I never thought I would find somebody worse than Andrew Johnson for president. This guy knocked him right out of the bottom. I love that I've you think never about seen that. that. <laughs> that's, that's your, I mean, Chester that's Arthur, your measuring Andrew stick. Johnson. That, Justice for Listen, Chester Arthur was anything. no end. Like Andrew John, the, the yeah. totally different. You yeah. know, there's poof. Anyway, this nation is so divided at this point, and basically we we're divided over the stupidest things on the face of the earth. Really. It, it, Trump is a pathological liar. He's insane. Uh, you know, just to drop... He's a drop in the bucket. I don't know why anybody would follow him. And then again, on the other side of the coin, we have uh, Biden, who, in my opinion, is a lot like Grassley. There comes a time when you just stop, because otherwise you're going to be a piece of granite just sitting there and not being able to do anything. What we need... Ooh, I just want to really quickly, because I want to make sure I get everyone's questions in. Okay. Continue your thought, but, but if you could get to your question, too. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm also kicking along with the women are going to decide this election. All right? I know that's going to happen. My question is, do you think we can ever, at least before I die, I hope, come back together as a nation that can actually see things in the future instead of just making up gobbledygook garbage all the time? We and can have, oh. we progress ahead as a nation? Is there anybody out there that can really be able to bring us all together and that you several, know of? There are several online questions like that about how to unify, if you see any unifying figures right now in American politics, American life? I mean, there are people who are willing to cross party lines and try to be unifying. There's a difference between whether or not those people are politically viable. Um, I, I want to choose to believe that we can get to that place again, though. There's an emailed question along these lines, too. Are there uh, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, are they going to form a third party? You know what? I don't know. I, I don't think third party is the solution. Um, one, this is a two-party nation, and fine, go ahead, create a third party, but then where's your apparatus, yeah. your national apparatus to compete with those two entrenched parties? We will get, th we will get through this, sir. We, this nation has been through, has been through a lot. Um, a civil war, uh, Jim Crow, uh, the civil rights movement in the 60s where, you know, folks were being bombed simply and, and shot and killed and lynched simply because they wanted to live the American dream as promised in this nation's founding documents. So, yes, the, the, the moment we are in right now is probably the most tenuous moment our democracy has been in since its founding simply because of what the previous president has done and continues to do to our national fabric. But I don't spend a lot of time, as much as I you know, revere politicians, particularly pro politicians who uphold their oath, I pay attention to the American people. And when the American people are moving en masse in certain ways where they are more open, say, to women going to work, if you want to go way back in the decades, more open to interracial marriage, more open to um, a working first lady, more open to their LGBT, 
LGBT neighbors more open to, do you understand, we as a nation have been having a conversation about transgender Americans, but also transgender children and their parents who are actively trying to help their children lead regular children's lives in, in the, the identity that is truly theirs. I'm an out gay man, out gay married man. If you had told me 30 years ago that I would be, we would be having a national conversation, not just about transgender Americans, but transgender children and talking, having these conversations with widespread compassion, I would have told you, you are crazy. It'll never happen. And yet here we are. So as crazy and jacked up as our national politics are and deeply concerning um, our politics are, where this country is moving, it's inexorable. And it's in, it, it, we're moving inexorably in a, forward, in a forward march. All we need to have happen is for our elected officials in both parties, but particularly Republicans, to get back on the road of supporting elected officials and supporting people who believe in the Constitution, who believe in that oath, and who want to govern this country with Democrats, with fellow Americans, rather than tearing it down for pure political gain. All right. I want to see if we can get in these last two questions over here. I don't think you've got a question yet. Oh, okay. All right, go ahead. Um, this question is actually coming from the BC High division over there. Hey! <laughs> um, so, in and, every... And I feel so bad, but we're just, we are keeping a short time, but go ahead. In every special election since post Dobbs, uh, the Democrats have outperformed. Do you believe that the Democrats will be able to carry this momentum into November? They hope to. Yeah. I mean, they, they better, <laughs> is, is what I would say. But the thing that makes me most nervous about Democrats is Democrats love to fret and worry. And I'm just waiting to see what is going to be that thing that'll hit maybe next week or early October where the, suddenly it's Democrats fearful that they've blown their chances. We almost saw it last week with the potential of that rail strike. Yeah. I was yeah, watching that and yeah. thinking, oh, there it is. Yeah. But it was averted. But so, it's a reminder. There is so Maddie, much. Maddie, <laughs> yes, Maddie. Maddie. We're, we're at the heart of it. Maddie. <laughs> Maddie. Maddie. But really, it's a reminder. There's sure <laughs> that there's so much time left. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, too, though, like this issue on Roe has sustained over the course of an entire yeah. summer. Now it's tune-in season, right? Like you get to September, people start dialing in, money starts flooding onto the airwaves. I mean, all yeah. of it gets real really fast. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, for coming out. This was such a thrill. Um, I just had a quick question, just following up on something Jonathan said earlier, because I think about this a lot. So Mitch McConnell had the audacity to give that speech after a second impeachment, after voting to not convict him, said he was guilty. So, and Mark Leibovich wrote about this in his book, uh, thank you for your servitude, that behind the scenes, they all can't stand him. Like the Republican Party does not like him. They wish he would probably fall off the face of the earth. Donald does not Trump. like Mitch McConnell? Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. Okay. I'm sorry, Donald Trump. Okay. Do you think we will ever get to a place, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road after Donald Trump lost the White House, lost the Senate, lost the House, could potentially be responsible for them losing the Senate this time? Will they ever regret not voting to convict him in that second impeachment? They had their chance and they let it just flitter away. <laughs> I, I might have an answer to that. I, whatever they truly feel, I don't think they will ever publicly say yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Not so publicly. I, I think that um, that's where they are. And we sort of need a, to invent a word for kind of what's happening now in our politics is that, and, and the Republican side is what you're talking about right now, it's a key example of politicians finding a way to convince themselves that what's politically expedient is somehow true or right. Now, that's always been part of politics, but now it's supercharged. Now it's dangerous. And, and I think that that's the case there. Well, it was the right thing. 
not to vote guilty, even though I really think the president's guilty because somehow, like Rob Portman, for example, oh, the process was too short. That's why yeah. I didn't vote guilty. They find a way, you know, and I, I just, so I think that <clears throat> publicly, whatever their true sentiment is, this generation of politicians won't say that. I do think future generations of Republicans, <clears throat> whatever that Republican looks like, Republican Party looks like, could be very different. I, I don't know. It could go either way. But I think there will be judgment one way or the other by future generations of, of Republicans on this generation of Republican. Thanks. So. Um, and I think that is, oh, we have one more. Can we sneak in Just one more? A real quick question or a statement. Um, I think probably all of us would agree that there are absolutely no coincidences. Secondly, we should all believe in faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now I'll get to my question. Uh, <laughs> um, I studied uh, political science at the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia. Spiders. Yes, spiders. Um, and I had a great professor, um, and one of the required courses for our political science studies was the American presidency. And he said, never forget the pendulum. So when you're analyzing a president, and what the country's needs are, you'll watch that pendulum. Now, we just had the pendulum go fast to the right and smash. So now it's moving to the left. My question of the panel, and I respect your opinions and insight, is where do you think the pendulum is and where do you think it will go? Wow. Huh. I think the issue is there's oh, multiple like... pendulums right now. And yeah. I think sometimes they hit each other. You know, so I. I, I, I believe in that too. I'd see it more in terms of the country's more or less stable is the, is the pendulum I think about. And I think we've continued to swing to like more divide, less stable, and, and it hasn't started to swing back quite yet. Um, but if you're thinking of like, you know, are Democrat, Republican, I don't think it works like that. I think there's multiple different pendulums. Like Jonathan's saying, there's different waves in different places that are reacting at the same time. Everyone's reacting. Even just like norms and traditions though, right? Like, I mean, that's one of the pendulums that I think of and I love the way yeah. that you reframed this because I think that was the whole point of the Biden candidacy yeah. now presidency, right? right? It's like retor return mm -hmm. some normalcy yeah. mm -hmm. to this yeah. joint and like, we'll see what happens yeah. next. And I think then what you see on the legislating front is Democrats attempting to put that pendulum further when it comes to social infrastructure, care yes. economy, yes. all of those key things mm -hmm. that were in the artist formerly known as Build Back Better and now yeah. whittled down to the Inflation <laughs> yeah. Reduction Act. But, but all of that is the attempt of the pendulum to swing to the left and you know, the people who are elected by the voters in Congress saying, eh, not quite there. Yeah. We're good, but not quite there. I absolutely agree. My, uh, the further question is, if Biden chooses not to run after the midterm results, I think we're going to see the first woman president of the United States. Boy, do I have a book for you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. With that, I have to thank this fantastic audience because I think that we can all agree that it's this kind of thought that helps, of course, the country solve its problems. And so thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Jonathan thank you. Capehart, Ali Batali. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for this incredible library.